Wall Street indices close a choppy trading session mixed as investors digest big earnings. Goldman Sachs posts a weak first quarter while streaming giant Netflix delivers mixed results and pushes back its crackdown on password sharing. Meanwhile, hawkish commentary from Fed officials signals more rate hikes before a pause. Stocks in the Asia-Pacific trade mixed but largely come off lows. The SGX Nifty is indicating a mildly lower start for the Indian market. Government reimposes windfall tax on crude oil production, setting it at 6,400 rupees a ton. Diesel exports will no longer uh, see any duty, at least for now, while the levies on petrol and jet fuel continue to be nil. The Supreme Court says India needs to move towards an equal future while keeping in mind its limitation as it hears pleas to legalize same-sex marriages. The centre argues legislative intent has always been to only recognize marriage between a man and a woman. The Kremlin reports about Vladimir Putin's visit to Russian-occupied areas of Kherson and Luhansk in Ukraine. The Russian president's second such trip in less than two months. The Kremlin claims that Putin attended a military command meeting in the Kherson region. Good morning in the Mumbai News Centre. I'm Solal Bhutra and you're watching Power Breakfast. It's Wednesday morning and we do have a lot of earnings which came through in the US markets impacting the way US markets move. We'll discuss that in greater detail. But first up, as always, let's take a look at what the Asian markets are doing. They are largely mixed after the mixed cues that we got from the uh, US markets as well. Hang Seng is seeing a big cut right now, six tenths of a percent gone there, while the Taiwanese index is high by 20 odd points as we speak. Um, if we talk about the other indices as well, something like a Nikkei, which is largely lower, 100 point cut out there. We also have Shanghai sitting with cuts of around 5 odd points. And as a result of this, uh, the SX Nifty, which has recovered from the lows, and that has been the case uh, with the other Asian indices as well. Uh, this one is indicating a cut of around 12 odd points, but has seen a substantial recovery from the lows. So uh, let's see whether that that is the uh, thing that happens with our own markets or not. But for now, it's a slight negative start, which the SGX Nifty is indicating for our own markets. Uh, let's talk about the US markets then. Wall Street ended largely flat in overnight session. The Dow Jones and Nasdaq closed with a mild negative bias, while the S&P 500 clocked a minor three-point gain. Focus remains on earnings, with Bank of America reporting a strong quarter, while Goldman Sachs posted a weak set of numbers, hurt by a slowdown in deal-making. From the tech space, streaming giant Netflix uh, beat analyst expectations on earnings per share but fell short of estimates on revenue that came at $8.16 billion. Shares fell as much as 10% in after-hour trading but recovered most of the losses. Most importantly, Netflix has delayed the much-awaited crackdown on password sharing to the second quarter of 2023. CNBC's Bertha Coombs gets us a wrap of all the action on Wall Street. Markets finishing the day mostly flat, the Dow closing slightly lower, shedding about 10 points. The S&P finishing marginally higher, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq was a shade lower. Boeing shares getting a boost after the company's CEO told investors that a manufacturing flaw found in some of its 737 MAX planes will not slow down the delivery schedule for the popular jet. The stock fell last Thursday after the company disclosed a problem found in parts of the fuselage that came from a supplier. Shares were back up, though, today on optimism that it will still hit its delivery targets. And Fox and Dominion reaching a settlement agreement just moments before opening arguments were set to begin in their lawsuit. Dominion, which makes voting machines, sued Fox for defamation after it was the target of false claims from Fox News anchors following the 2020 presidential race. Fox agreed to pay Dominion more than $787 million as part of the settlement, which amounts to about half what Dominion had asked for in the lawsuit. That's what's happening here in the U.S. Back to you in Mumbai. Okay, all right, that's the U.S. market action, and let's stay with that then. St. Louis Federal Reserve President James Bullard says the Fed should continue raising interest rates on the back of recent data, while Atlanta Fed President Rafal Bostic told CNBC he favors raising rates one more time and then holding them above 5% for some time. Let's listen into his comments. After the next move, uh, if, the, if the data come in as I expect, uh, we will be able to hold there for quite some time. Now, you know, I've been saying for a while, I don't think that inflation is going to come down quickly. Uh, it's going to take uh, some effort 
and a resoluteness on our part. So once we get to that point, I don't have us really doing anything uh, but monitoring the economy for the rest of this year and into 2024. Part of this is really about the pace of inflation's uh, returning back to our 2% target. You know, I don't think that's going to happen as quickly as some of the markets do. And it seems that um, the question is, who's right on this? I think that we've made a lot of movement in the last several months. Uh, but now the hard part happens. Okay, so that is some Fed commentary coming in. Let's also hear out what uh, Wharton School's Jeremy Siegel and Bank of America CEO Brian Monihan make of the Fed's policy decisions and their impact on the economy. I've done a calculation using current uh, prices and core year over year using current housing prices, both on rentals and on owner-occupied homes, is down to 2% year over year. But it's over 5% in the official statistics. So I think inflation basically is, is back down to the Fed target. Using real housing data, both on the rental and on uh, home prices, yes. Two over two, wow. year over year, using actual housing data, not the delayed housing data that the, the Fed uses. We base our earnings on the, the market, and the market has a one Fed increase left in a forward curve and then has cuts. Whether those come true or not uh, is really going to be dependent on what the Fed sees after they, at each meeting, because they're completely driven by trying to figure out what's going on in data. Our team, uh, Candace Browning Platt and research team, have a recession and have consistently had a recession predicted for the second half of this year, uh, third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter of next year, and then ends, and it, we start to see positive growth. And so that's based on the Fed tightening having finally taken hold, and, and those experts see that. Okay, all right. That's the global market action and commentary and expert opinion coming in. But how will these overnight queues impact our own markets? We have our research team joining in to tell you just that. A lot of domestic queues that we have to uh, talk about as well. What's the trade setup looking like? The stocks that are likely to be in the news and the action from the FNO space as well. Hey, guys. A very good morning to all of you. Um, Ekta, as always, let me come across to you first up. Uh, what are the market queues we need to watch out for today's trading session? Hi, thanks for that. Well, good morning. It turned out to be a little bit of trepidation for the second consecutive trading session for our market. So the Sensex and the Nifty fell for the second straight day. And we had the Sensex and the Nifty closing with minor cuts yesterday. FII's net sold for the second consecutive session. So that was one of the big cues to watch out for, considering that we have seen the FII's buy continuously in the past couple of trading sessions. So FII's net sold around 810 crores, DII's net bought around 400 odd crores. You've been talking about what took place in the US markets. It seems as though earnings is top of mind. Netflix disappointed. Bank of America was okay. Goldman Sachs uh, was a bit disappointing. But there was no kind of spillover in terms of systemic risk uh, for the banking space so that seemed to be a positive. Asia is currently mixed and the SGX is currently indicating a bit of a soft start. Crude has edged higher on falling US inventory as well as Chinese data. Just watch out for two factors for our markets, the broader markets outperforming and the nifty bank showing resilience going forward as well. We have earnings today, ICICI Securities, Mastec, Tata Communication, so a couple of numbers to watch out for. Yes, okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Ekta, for all those cues. That is the market setup for today. But a lot of stocks will be in focus as well. Vivek is joining us with that list. Hey, Vivek, good morning. Well, good morning. Absolutely, quite a few results that came in post-market as yesterday. First on our list is ICI Lombard. You know, it's been a slightly mixed quarter from the company. While the profitability was above our pool, uh, you know, profitability coming in close to 437 crore versus our pool of close to 377 crore. Some of the other parameters were a slight miss. So the net earned premium came in at close to 3,726 versus our pool of a slightly over uh, 4,000 crore. We're also talking about the gross direct premium income coming in close to 4,977 crore versus our pool of over 5,195 crore. Now, when you're talking about the management commentary, one key point to uh, keep track of, the management has continued to maintain its guidance of a combined ratio of 102%, and this is something that the street will take some confidence from. Also, watch out for Tata Coffee. The company delivered its results yesterday. Revenues higher by 10%, coming in at the 723 crore mark. However, 
EBITDA as well as EBITDA margins has actually contracted. Margins coming in at 15% versus 17% last time around. However, profitability jumped higher by almost 9%. Uh, keep an eye out for Pyramid Pharma. Some positive news flow coming in over there. The US FDA completed the inspection of the company's Telesur manufacturing facility. No Form 483 uh, you know, observations and therefore the company got an EIR, that is an establishment inspection report. <coughs> Lastly, Avalon Technologies, yesterday's listing, you know, Goldman Sachs picked up almost 7.95 lakh shares in the company via block deals yesterday. Okay, a lot of stocks which are in focus. Thank you, Vic, for that list. Let me go across to Nigel now with all the cues from the FNO space. Hey, Nigel. Well, um, morning, Sonal. In yesterday's trading session, you had the financial Nifty services that played out its expiry, and that could be one of the reasons that we ended low, and the Nifty Bank didn't participate yesterday. At the end of the day, we're looking at the total open interest, and both on the Nifty and on the Nifty Bank, well, there was some shedding in terms of open interest, so some unwinding of positions is what we saw. The FI as well, in the FNO market, they didn't do much, you know, uh, little bit of uh, uh, unbinding is what we saw in short, some long addition as well. So not much action out there. But the long positioning now goes to around 37% uh, odd, while the short positioning is at around 63%. The options data was quite interesting. Remember the PCR from around 1.2 odd, that's come down to sub 1. It's around 0.82 odd. And yesterday you saw a fair bit of call writing. 17,700 calls, 17,800 calls, both of them fairly active in trade yesterday. Added close to around 70 lakh shares or thereabouts. So aggressive writing is what we saw out there. Because of that writing, well, one gets a sense that the bears, they want to defend that 17,850 or closer to around the 100 DMA, the level comes up for you on the screen. But you'll believe that we're still in a range of around 300 points odd, as long as the crucial support of around 17,550 does hold out. The Nifty Bank, yes, it was a little bit off color. And remember, that's the one that's been in fine form. So in yesterday's trading session, you saw some call writing being seen at around the 42,500 call. And in fact, from around the 42,500 odd mark, we did a bit of a U-turn. So let's see how that one uh, pans out from here. The resistance level comes in at around 42,600. On the downside, though, as long as that 41,700 odd mark, which is the 100 DMA, holds out, you'll believe we're good for more. SGX Nifty was indicating a deeper gash, but for the time being, it's indicating a bit of a downtick of close to around 20 points. So let's see how this one goes. Back to you. Okay, all right. Thank you, Nigel, for uh, those cues from the FNO space. Uh, this is our Power Prep segment. Uh, we'll slip into a break now. Up next, the government has issued its latest revision in the windfall gains tax. More details after the short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still tuned in to Power Breakfast. Well, the government in its latest revision to the windfall gains tax has reimposed duty on crude oil prices at uh, 6,400 rupees a ton. So basically from nil, it has been increased because of high crude prices during that period. The duty on diesel has been reduced to nil from 50 paisa a litre earlier, while the levy on petrol and jet fuel exports continue to be nil. So of course, it's positive for the likes of Reliance Industries, which has higher diesel exports, but negative for oil producers like ONGC. Well, the Finance Ministry has issued a clarification after reports yesterday suggested that the government was looking to revamp income tax laws with a focus on capital gains. The Finance Ministry has said that no such overhaul of the capital gains tax was being considered. And moving on, a five-judge Supreme Court bench led by the Chief Justice heard pleas seeking the legalization of same-sex marriages. The center has argued it is not appropriate for courts to decide on the issue. While the apex court says there is an evolving consensus on an equal future, the hearing will continue uh, today as well. Ashmit Kumar joins us. Uh, some strong comments coming from the CGI, Ashmit. Indeed, in fact, the CGI was very clear that he will not allow any of the parties to dictate the nature of these proceedings. And that came in response to the Solicitor General saying that even before we get into the merits of the case on whether or not there should be same-sex marriage allowed, there's a preliminary objection being raised by the centre. The objection being uh, that there should be absolutely no meddling in this issue by the judiciary. This is the exclusive preserve of the Parliament, of the legislature. And that was the preliminary objection. Uh, that has not been allowed yet. In fact, the Chief Justice uh, continued with these proceedings, continued to allow the petitioners to make their submissions, which in fact led to the Solicitor General remarking at one point that this will compel the Centre to think whether or not they will wish to participate in these proceedings. So strong comments, those from the Solicitor General, but not uh, managing to impress uh, the Chief Justice. He decided to continue uh, and to allow the petitioners to make their submissions, led by Mukul Rahatki. He was appearing 
think, for the petitioners in this case. Uh, he went on to, uh, to argue that the center's contention that this is an urban elitist concept is, in fact, misplaced and that that cannot be used to deny fundamental rights that fall uh, to the LGBTQ community. He further went on to say that uh, for the center to argue that they constitute a minuscule minority uh, then is a representation of the majoritarianism attitude and that that is simply not constitutionally sustainable, that the fundamental rights provided a uh, right to life, right to privacy, uh, the preamble, the way it is structured, clearly mandates that the uh, burden falls on the center, on the government to ensure that these rights are freely accessible and that there can be no distinction made between uh, heterosexual couples and same-sex couples. Ashwin, thank you so much for joining us with all those details. We keep coming back to you for more updates on this important story. For now, we'll uh, take a short break. Up next, we'll get you all the cues from the commodities market. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Uh, well, let's talk about commodities now. Uh, Manisha Gupta is joining us with all the update from the commodity space. Hey, Manisha, good morning. What's up in the commodity markets? Well, thank you for that. I'll start with the crude oil prices where we have seen some profit taking, but even with that, we are holding steady above $80 a barrel. The Chinese economy has shown growth in the first quarter, and the Chinese refineries also have processed higher crude, actually record high crude in the month of March. OPEC will start reducing from the month of May, and the Russian crude oil exports in the meanwhile have been above 3 million barrels per day in the previous week. The U.S. crude inventories also have declined, and that seems to be supporting the crude prices in the Asian markets right now. So overall, 80 is where we are looking at a pivot point now coming in for the crude prices. But a very strong gain is what you are seeing in the metal prices. So whether it's aluminum, which gained up by 2.5% overnight, palladium is now trading at a two-month highs, Iron ore prices, which have been languishing at around three months, those also have seen some buying in last two trading sessions. The China strong demand estimate really seems to be working its magic across metals. And not just these, tin prices gained up by 10% overnight after Myanmar says, and Myanmar is the third largest producer of tin, they have banned mining activities from the month of August. So fundamentals really seem to be catching up as of now. Okay, thank you so much. So that, uh, that is all the update from the commodity markets. Uh, Manisha, thanks a lot for joining us. Moving on, yesterday Apple CEO Tim Cook threw open the gates of the 28,000 square feet retail store in Mumbai's Bandra Kula complex to a throng of Apple fans who queued up for hours to experience the range of products at the new store. The Apple Watch specially has emerged as a useful tool for collecting health parameters and performance metrics for the athletes. The Apple CEO visited the Mumbai Cricket Association's badminton courts and spoke to News 18 India's Debashish Sarkar on how the Apple Watch has emerged as a key tracker of health parameters for sports persons. Listen in. Welcome to Mumbai. How are you? It's wonderful to be here. Thank it's you. so great to be in India. We've looked forward to this week for a long time. It feels so lovely to meet you in person. And today I want to talk about the Apple Watch. Yes. Uh, you know, how has Apple been able to create uh, such a health and fitness device uh, that, that can reach so many people in a meaningful way, be it professional athletes or somebody like me who just wants to stay fit? You know, it started with focusing on wellness and these creating the three rings, the move, stand, uh, and your, your exercise bar. And it went from there to heart rate and uh, detecting AFib. And of course, notifications came early on as well. And so it has just expanded to cover the, the waterfront of people's needs. And it's so great for me to come here and hear how it's used in actual training. Uh, but I get notes every day from people who uh, found out they had AFib. Right. And they, they've told me that their doctors told them they would have died if they had not know, found out about it and reached out to a doctor for a call. And so we just keep pulling the string to see where it takes us. Uh, one of the athletes here today told me that they use the sleep function a lot. Right. And all of them use the heart rate function to see which heart rate zone they're operating in. And, and so there's just a enormous amount of functionality in this little thing that you yes. put on your wrist now. Right. It's, it's fantastic. 
Okay, all right. Uh, some uh, commentary coming in from Apple CEO there. But moving on through some international news now. Russian President Vladimir Putin made a second visit to Ukraine since March to the annexed regions of Kherson and Luhansk. The Kremlin said he was there to attend a military meeting to hear reports from his commanders. Reacting to this, Ukrainian President Zelensky's advisor tweeted that Putin was touring the occupied territories to enjoy the crimes of his minions for the last time. Okay, so that is some international update as far as the global markets are concerned. Let's take a look at the Asian markets again because there was some recovery which we were seeing uh, on the SGX Nifty. The Hang Seng as we speak uh, is still down. In fact, it has uh, worsened in terms of moves. So 1.2% is the fall on Hang Seng and Taiwanese index has also fallen from the top. SGX Nifty too at the start of the show was down around 10 odd points. And as we speak, SGX Nifty is indicating that the start for our own markets could be in the red. A 26 point downtick is what that index is suggesting. Uh, we'll do one thing. Take your leave on this edition of Power Breakfast. Uh, stay tuned. Bazaar Morning Call comes up next.